Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, for Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're so glad that you can join us for this next part of our study in 2 Timothy, as we continue on in the third chapter. We've been in the third chapter for a while because it deserves our attention. Because we're in those perilous last days. Because we are indeed. We need to be able to recognize the behavior, the characteristics, and the attitude of people. And this is speaking, you know, the world is always the same. Right. This is talking about the so-called church. Right. And we need to be able to recognize this, and we need to be on guard about it in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Okay? So take this, take this that way. Uh, we left off last week, and I said I'd gotten into just get started with a word in the fourth verse about treacherous, or the King James says traitors, right? And I did not have time to do that justice that it deserves, so I want to go back and start there today. But before we do, let me first of all ask, Father, that you would just bless our time together. Lord, that you would open the ears of our heart, the eyes of our heart, that we might see wonderful things in your word. Father, that we might be able to proclaim like Jeremiah, your prophet, mm. that thy word was found and we ate it. It became for us a joy and a delight of our lives, of our hearts, Lord God. Lord, we want to treasure your word. Mm. You. We know that your word is everything. It's healing to us. It leads us in those paths of righteousness. So, Lord, I just I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit here within us. And I thank you for the presence of your Son, Christ Jesus, in our midst. Bless this time in Jesus' name, we pray. All right. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And as I said, we left off in verse 4, uh, talking about the word treacherous. And again, it's treacherous in the New American Standard, which I'm using. Uh, the King James calls it traitors. Okay. Yeah. Well, because they're, they are, they're related words, okay? The only other place that's used in the scripture, it, it talks about Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. He was a traitor. It says yes. he became a traitor in, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 6, 16. But the word treachery, treacherous, treachery, comes from an old French word that means to deceive, mm -hmm. okay? Right. And treachery is marked by a betrayal of fidelity, of faithfulness. When you betray right. a you're faithfulness, right? yeah. you're unfaithful. Okay? A treacherous person cannot be relied on. No. I mean, that's a simple statement. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, right? Mm -hmm. But men in the last days are going to be treacherous. treacherous. That's, that's one of the signs. Which means that their word will be no good. You can't, you can't count on people to do what they say. They, you can't count on them to be trustworthy, right? You know, when I was a young man, no, not a young man, when I was a boy. Very, I, very young. <laughs> I, I probably was very young. Um, when my father would teach me, and, and he, he taught me that, you know, you have, to, you have to pay attention to what you say. Your word is your bond. You say something, you've got to do it. Is that not a reasonable statement? Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is today, even written contracts seem to be written in sand rather than in stone. Okay? Right. I mean, right. contracts are renegotiated or simply broken with impunity in these days. Contracts don't seem to, to matter in the least, let alone a person's word. Look at divorce. I See, I don't think that there is a greater covenant, a greater agreement, a greater contract made than that marriage. Mm -hmm. that when you come to, when a man and a woman are brought together by, by God Almighty and brought together, that the vows that they make to one another and in the presence of God, what contract is higher than that? What, what words are more significant than that? That's why I said, you know, when here in, in the United States a number of years ago, when the issue came up, and so many American presidents, it's been shown, have been unfaithful to their wives or spouses, uh, even while they're in the office. But so when I was going to say, when Bill Clinton was obviously caught being very, very unfaithful to his wife, people 
particularly those people who supported him, say, what difference does it make? What's that got to do? What's his private life got to do? Because you know what it's got to do? Everything. That's what it's got to do. Because if he can't be trusted to be, if he can't be trustworthy mm-hmm. when it comes to the vows that he made to his spouse when they got married, what in the world makes you think that he'll be faithful to any other agreement he makes? Is any politician faithful to a Well, But it's not just a matter of politician. I mean, how, how faithful are, are people being in their marriage vows at all? Right. No. We've More gotten to the place today. where a lot of people aren't just bothering getting married because the divorce rate is so high. Mm. The divorce rate is, well, you know, how can, it, how can it have come to the place where divorce was so uncommon when I was a child right. to the place now where it is common practice to create prenuptial agreements, yes. a contract on how you're going to divide the spoils when you have, when you when have, this doesn't you know, suit so us anymore. Yeah. When it doesn't suit you. So the marriage contract, the, the marriage agreement, the marriage covenant, when I break that, then I'm going to have a written piece of paper that's going to say what I'm going to be faithful to do. You know what? It doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't work. Mm-mm. So many people in the world today enter in, they won't enter into marriage unless they've planned for the breaking of that covenant. That's a prenup agreement, right? We are called, we, you and I, you and I are called to be imitators of God. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, in the prophet Jeremiah, one of the first things in the very beginning of the first chapter of, of God's word to Jeremiah, he said, I watch over my word to perform it. Yes, he does. We need to come to that place where we can be trusted to watch over our word to perform it. When you say something to somebody, and it shouldn't require, I mean, you know, you may do that, but it shouldn't require a written contract. If you said it, do it. Otherwise, you are, I promise you, you are not imitating God. You know who you're imitating? Well, let me see. Treacherous. You can't be counted to do your word. It's deceit. Who is the father of lies? Ta da. <laughs> That's who you're imitating. And you know, it's not just, it's, I'm not just talking about in the great big deals. If you tell somebody you're going to be somewhere, you're going to do something, do it. Watch over your word to perform it. I honestly believe with all my heart, I mean, this is a sign of the last days, how bad it's going to be. But that if we, the believers, the the bond servants, the remnant, if we would watch over our word to perform it, the world would take notice because they don't do that. Okay. Otherwise, now I I don't believe you can lose your salvation. I I think I mentioned this at the end of last week. I do believe you can give it up. Walk away. You, you can walk away. You can desert. Okay? You can be unfaithful and desert. The great example of that happens to be in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, when it says, when Jesus' word became too difficult for many of his disciples, not the hangers on, it says his disciples, as many of his disciples left him, walked away, because his word was too difficult. We can't obey this anymore. That's what they said. Mm -hmm. So they deserted. Okay? That apostasy that is coming. And that's what what that's the prophecy. There's going to be great apostasy. There's not there is not a prophecy that in the last days there's going to be a great revival. Jesus said it, Paul said it, that there's going to be a great apostasy, a great falling away. But it's not it's not, you know, they're not tripping over something other than the rock of offense, whose name is Jesus. But they're choosing to walk away like they did, right? Yes. John, it's, that's John 60 Six. and John 666. Go check it out. Think about it. Meditate on it. John 666. Yeah, when John 666. When, they, when, it got, when his word got too difficult, they became deserters. They were traitors, right? When marriage gets too difficult, men and women desert. They divorce. They divorce. God when, hates divorce. Hates divorce. When a business deal, an agreement, becomes too difficult, it is breaking. Mm-hmm. Oh, I gotta renegotiate this. I can't, I'm not gonna live by this. We're living in a time, listen to what I'm saying, that when life becomes too difficult, and we're living in challenging times, people desert and leave. 
suicide. Suicide is increasing around the world by leaps and bounds. People are deserting life because because they can't deal with the difficulty. Mm -hmm. I want you to know the most treacherous enemies of the church are the fallen away. The ones who have chosen apostasy. Mm -hmm. So many of them become venomous. Mm -hmm. Which is what a serpent is, is, right? The next word that's used here in this list is reckless. Mm -hmm. The King James says heady. In Acts 16, that word that's used here is also translated as rashly, you know, know, rash behavior, Mm. okay? This means, and reckless means taking action without thinking it through. No care. Well, you're not, you haven't thinking it, you haven't thought it through. You're being indifferent to it or you're just disregarding the potential consequences. Although for a follower of Jesus, it is not about you thinking it through, which certainly would lead to leaning on your own understanding, right? right? And we're commanded not to do that in Proverbs 3, 5. It's about taking the right course of action. And the right course of action is, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, James 1, 19. If you're leaning on your own understanding, you're going to behave rashly. You're going to be reckless. Wouldn't it to people, when God tells you to do something, I have someone in mind, Jim Skinnell, and when God tells you to do something to the world, it could look reckless. Alice Alice was talking about a a friend of ours, and this is going back, gosh. In the 70s. 70s, probably about 77, 77. we were talking about. He was a, a dear brother. Uh, he worked for IBM, and he'd worked for IBM for just shy of 15 years. And he had an incredible ministry. He played the guitar, and he would go around to these different house meetings all over and just pick up his guitar. And I think he knew, I think he knew a grand total of three or three and a half chords. And he would start playing, and I'll tell you, the spirit would just fall on that place. It was really amazing. And he said that God, I remember when we had this conversation, yeah. God told him to leave his job and go do that full time. Well, he was prepared to do that. Everybody else was saying to him, that's reckless. Mm-hmm. Because you see, he was only months short of his, pension. of his pension. Because if you were there for 15 years with IBM, you had a vested interest in your pension. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. But he said, well, no, God told me to go now. So he walked away from that pension. He walked away. Now, Jim was married and had six children. Yes. <clears throat> Does that sound reckless? Only if you appraise it in a natural. Yeah, sure. Finish the story. Yeah. Okay, I'll finish the story. <clears throat> because what happened was, he was doing that, and he was driving down. He lived in Peekskill. He was driving down towards the city one day on the West Side Highway. And as he was, which runs right along the Hudson River, he saw a young man standing by the edge, and the Spirit of God said to him, stop, go talk to him. So he went over, he stopped, pulled the car off the road, and went over, and he was talking to this young guy. When I say young guy, he was probably in his, 20s. in his early 20s, 21, 22. And he was standing there preparing to commit suicide. He was going to jump into the Hudson River and drown himself. Well, Jim ministered to him. It turned out he was a, a Jewish fellow. And Jim ministered to him, prayed with him, and he received the Lord. And everything in that young man's life, Changed instantly, totally, completely. Wait, there's more to as who was it? Paul Harvey <coughs> used to say. And the rest of the story. There's more to the story. The rest of the story. Because it turned out that young man's father was a, an executive with a record company in New York City, and the upshot he wanted to meet Jim. He wanted to meet the fellow who had rescued his son. Well, it wasn't Jim that rescued his son. It was Jesus Christ. So he got to tell him about Jesus Christ. But the upshot of it was that that record executive made it possible for Jim to start recording records. He provided the backup uh, musicians. He provided... So he could he, create an album. Yeah. Create albums, print the records for free. And it kicked off, <clears throat> really kicked off the ministry for Jim. Yeah. God had a plan. Yes, he did. 
So acting rashly, acting recklessly, isn't about what it looks like to the world. It's about, if you are not doing what God is telling you to do, there is nothing that you could do more reckless than that. Right. Another example from the Bible would be Stephen. Well, there are many, 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 many examples. Okay, so I don't want to get too far because we've got a lot to cover here. But the, the point is, you got to understand, if, if, if it's coming from your own understanding mm -hmm. without being led by the Holy Spirit, and his promises, God said he promised to lead you in paths of righteousness. But he'll lead you in what may look like some very strange places. But if he's leading, you follow, okay? And not receiving the free gift of salvation is reckless. That is more than reckless. It is absolutely reckless. All right, so the next one is conceited. The King James says high-minded, all right? Being a lover of self will always lead to self-importance, pride. And as we know, pride goes before destruction yes. and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's Proverbs 16, 18. You know, the word makes this very, very clear. In Romans 12, verse 3, it says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. You have to be careful about getting boastful, about getting proud. You have to be careful because God has called us to humble ourselves in order that he might exalt us. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you want to know something? God opposes the proud. You don't want God in opposition to you, I promise you. And you know, pride, this, this, this high-mindedness, this... It's so dangerous. Talking about the last days, there's a supreme danger, particularly in the last days, when, like the folks in the assembly, that's called the church at Laodicea, in the book of Revelations in the third chapter, it says, because you say, this is God, this is Jesus writing a letter to them through the apostle John on Patmos. And he said, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Revelation chapter 3, that's verses 17 and 18. Or worse yet, and this is worse yet, that high-minded attitude can carry over to the point where one actually carries it into the very presence of Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, talking about that day of judgment, when people come into the presence of God, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Whoa. Thinking that they could impress the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the King of Glory, with what they had done, rather than bowing down, falling down, and thanking him for what he had done, no greater example of being conceited or high-minded than believing in salvation by works. Yes. That he's going to be impressed by what you've done. That you've earned something by what you've done. It's the, salvation is not of works lest any man should boast. It is a free gift of God so that nobody boasts, right? Don't get high-minded. Be on guard against it. Examine yourself. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ and you won't get boastful about yourself because you don't compare to him, although he's making you like him. Don't believe in salvation by works. Don't trust in what you do. Trust in what he is doing in you and through you and what he has done for you. Amen. The next one is being a lover of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Okay, let me just tell you, we're here in the United States of America. I know a number of you out there listening and watching this you're not in the United States of America, but you are where God wants you to be because he 
determines your boundary, the boundaries of your habitation. The Declaration of Independence was written in Congress on July 4th in 1776, says this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson penned that. Well, I don't want to disillusion you, but you have no right to life. Absolutely right. You were born in sin, you were conceived in sin, and the wages of sin is death. You have no right to life. And yet, the Lord God Almighty puts it out and offers it to you as a free gift. Mm -hmm. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. Mm -mm. And the pursuit of happiness. Really, is that what your life is about? The pursuit of happiness? You know, you don't need to go to the Constitution or any other place to find the way. Let me take you to the Word. In Psalm 73, I'm going to read verses 25 through 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all of those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. The nearness of God. Alice and I have a favorite song that I tend to sing to her a lot. Hoagie Carmichael, you ever hear Hoagie Carmichael? Probably no. not. <laughs> young, young whippersnapper. Hoagie Carmichael wrote, I, It's not the pale moon that delights me, or the warm night that excites me. Oh, no. It's just the nearness of you. <laughs> and then. And then. And then. We changed that to a hymn. Well, because, you know, it says to extract the, extract the precious from the worthless. you you got to find the precious. It says to the pure, all things are pure. That's right. Find these things. One of the reasons that the nearness of Alice is so blessing, such a blessing to me, is because of the presence of God in her. I promise you that. I promise you that. Get near to God. You, you will find you are satisfied. Have you never heard? Have you never heard, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Mm -hmm. Seek at God. The only place that true pleasure or happiness, for that matter, can be found is in the presence of God. It is the fullness of joy, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is Psalm 1611. Listen to this now. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Where are you looking? Where do you think you're going to find these things that give you joy, that give you pleasure, that satisfy? Stop looking for it in the world and be content with what the Lord supplies you with. Because the Word of God says that if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. In 1 Timothy, right? 1 Timothy 6.8. And store up your treasures in heaven. All right, let me zip right along to verse 5. And then it talks about holding to a form of godliness, but denying the power. Right? Yes. After his resurrection, and just prior to his ascension into heaven, Jesus says in Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, Gathering them together, he's talking about his disciples, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You gotta be baptized with the Holy Spirit if you want yeah. to look for power, right? Power. Yes. And he continued on in verse eight, right? In Acts 1, eight, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even through the remotest part of the earth. Amen. Power from the spirit of truth for all believers 
is to be those witnesses in all the world proclaiming the truth. That's why he gives us power. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? It's, I, you know, a lot of people are looking for the power of God for the wrong reasons. Right, right. It's for about themselves. being yeah. faithful witnesses, right? Paul the Apostle, who was indeed sent by the Lord himself, set, and he was sent in power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that should be obvious to anybody, right? It says in 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18, he was sent by the Holy Spirit to preach the, the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That mighty man of God, who in Christ-like humility proclaimed, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 and 2. That is true godliness manifested in power. I keep seeing bigger and bigger churches all around America with smaller and smaller crosses. Mm. I'm not talking about on top of the building. I'm talking about in the hearts of the people that are ministering, preaching. And it's not just them. It's in the heart of the message that's yeah. coming out so of those churches. The word of the cross isn't being preached. Yeah, smaller crosses in the heart of the people. And that's a sign of the times. They're preaching self-esteem, not self-denial. If you want to know the heart of Jesus, go read Philippians chapter 2. Start in verse 5. Because it talks about Christ and his ministry. So I'm going to not have time to get into this the way I want. but Because it, that verse 5, 2 Timothy 3, 5, ends by saying, actually I should say it ends by commanding, Avoid such men as these. Right? Avoid such men as these. Do not be deceived, Paul wrote. Bad companies corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It does. You need to be careful who you hang out with, who you fellowship with. Okay? You know, the, the, the Pharisees, they got all upset because Jesus ate with the sinners. He didn't eat with them because they were their pals and the fellowship with them. He went out to bear witness to the work of the Father. It's not like you can't get it, you can't meet with unsaved people. And unsaved people are a lot safer for you than the ones who are supposedly saved and are not living it, who are being treacherous. But remember, bad company. Don't let them be your company. No. Hit the habit. Bring you down. They'll bring you down to them. Make the Lord God Almighty. Practice his nearness. To practice the presence of God in your life. Make him the company of your life. And you will see a change in your life. So Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen, because it says that you determine our times and the boundaries of our habitation. That you have decided that we should be living in these times. Father, I just pray that through your word, we would be faithful witnesses to your love, to your power, to your amazing grace. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can use us for the glory of your name. Amen and amen. Till next time, and be back. God bless you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.